Okay, everyone, I would like to introduce Wayne Gilberts. Gilberts? Yeah, pretty close. Okay. <laughs> he is going to be talking about the Battle of Lightning Creek. And so, thank you for coming in today. Here he is. I'm going to let him get started. Thank you. I grew up in uh, Belfouche and I live there still. Uh, but I was not familiar with the Lightning Creek fight incident until uh, a few years ago, about 12 years ago actually. I was reading a book about the uh, Carlisle Indian School football team that was coached by Pop Warner. And one of the players on that team was uh, named Charlie Smith. And Charlie was in uh, the Lightning Creek fight. But, um, so I was reading this book, it's called The Real All-American, and it's about, the, as I said, the Carlisle Indian School football team uh, that incidentally beat Harvard with the hidden ball trick. Uh, anyway. Uh, oh, there is a microphone, I'm sorry. So should I just start over? Sorry. I learned about the Battle of Lightning Creek about 10 or 12 years ago. I was reading a book uh, called The Real All-Americans, story of the Carlisle Indian School football team that was coached by Pop Warner and which beat the Harvard football team with the hidden ball trick, which was uh, frowned upon at the time, but it worked. Anyway, uh, in, the, in the book, uh, they mentioned that one of the Indian people that was involved in the Lightning Creek fight was named Charlie Smith, and he was a graduate of the Carlisle Indian School. At the time, I was doing a reenactment of John Brennan, who was the founder of Rapid City. And uh, so I was struck by a footnote in this book about the Carlisle Indian School football team that mentioned John Brennan. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I looked into this Battle of Lightning Creek. I called the South Dakota Historical Society and they didn't know anything about it. I called the uh, Wyoming Historical Society and spoke to a gentleman there who in a rather gruff voice said, yeah, I know about that. And, uh, and he sent me some materials on it, uh, which I'll refer to later. But, uh, Anyway, to give you a little background, I think what I'll do is start with Billy Miller, who was the Western County Sheriff who led the posse that encountered the Indians at Lightning Creek on Halloween Day in 1903. Uh, Billy Miller was born in Iowa, uh, I'm sorry, Ohio, and later moved to Iowa with his family, and later married a woman named Anna Miller, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that name. They had five children. They ran what was called a milk ranch, uh, a dairy farm, in the Newcastle area. But Billy was a rather popular local figure, and he was approached in the late uh, 1890s and asked to run for sheriff. And he did, and he won, and he was uh, elected and re-elected three times. Again, a very popular figure, very well liked, uh, uh, beloved sheriff actually. And uh, uh, so they gave up the milk ranch or the dairy farm and he became full-time sheriff of uh, Weston County. Uh, now, in the 1890s, uh, Wyoming had passed a number of game laws, uh, laws protecting Wyoming wild game particularly antelope in this area, but also elk in the Jackson area, uh, things like that. And the enforcement of that law seemed to have, in the 1890s, uh, focused largely on uh, Indians that were under the impression that they could uh, legally hunt game anywhere. Uh, turns out they were wrong. There was a case in the United States Supreme Court called the Racehorse Case, which ruled in about 1896 that uh, uh, when Wyoming became a state and was admitted into the Union, 
the treaties no longer applied as far as game hunting was concerned. So the fact is that uh, uh, Native Americans or anyone for that matter who was hunting game without a license and out of season in Wyoming was committing a criminal act. Um, it was it was enforced, but from what I've been able to find, the the uh, penalties were not very stringent. Uh, I found instances where uh, uh, violators of the game laws were fined ten dollars, and uh, which which you know we talk about inflation, but even in those days, ten dollars was not a lot of money. Uh, but so there was enforcement going on. Uh, Billy Miller was was active and diligent in trying to enforce the game law. Uh, Wyoming also had had at the time uh, violators of the game laws, not only from Indian people but from subsistence hunters. But it appears that most of the enforcement was directed at uh, Indians. Um, Billy Miller's tenure as sheriff was punctuated by a couple of interesting incidents. Uh, he was sheriff when a gentleman named Slim Clifton, who was being held in the jail for murder, was dragged out of the jail by a group of vigilantes and uh, lynched. He was thrown over a railroad viaduct and the, uh, with a noose around his neck and was decapitated. Uh, I believe that's the only instance of vigilante justice that I found in Newcastle itself. But that occurred during Sheriff Miller's tenure. The other thing that occurred is that uh, President Theodore Roosevelt visited Newcastle and Billy Miller was uh, the security detail for the president at the time. Um, and as I said, he was, um, he was diligent and resourceful in attempting to enforce game laws. Uh, now, what happened chronologically is that, well, before I get into the actual chronology, let me say that uh, it was pretty common for Lakota Indians from the Pine Ridge Reservation to travel off the reservation to this area in northeastern Wyoming. Uh, and they did so with permits that were issued by John Brennan, who was at that time the uh, uh, Indian agent on Pine Ridge. Uh, the purpose of the permits was uh, for the purpose of gathering herbs, medicinal herbs, uh, nuts and berries uh, in the area. Uh, the suspicion was perhaps justified, certainly it justified in some cases, that these bands that were permitted to leave Pine Ridge and come to this area were poaching uh, game. And sometimes they were accused of uh, killing cattle. Uh, so there was really quite a popular furor about these Lakota people who were coming to this area because it was largely assumed uh, in some cases justified, that they were here to poach Wyoming game uh, unlawfully. Now we turn to 1903 as to what happened. Uh, in late September of 1903, John Brennan issued a permit to a band of Indians led by a fellow named William Brown to leave Pine Ridge and come to this area. And um, these were, the band was consisted of uh, some adult males, also women and children, uh, that traveled with wagons and uh, uh, were given these permits. Uh, they left Pine Ridge in late September and came out to this area. Uh, about three weeks later, Brennan, the Indian agent, issued another permit to Charlie Smith. He's the fellow I mentioned earlier that had gone to the Carlisle Indian School uh, a couple of years before. Uh, his band, similar to the Brown Band, was composed of two or three adult 
males and some and families. Uh, the two bands uh, traveled separately until they happened more or less accidentally to meet up uh, in the Lightning Creek area uh, in uh, in late October. This kind of gives you an idea of where uh, the Lightning Creek was. You can see it here on this map. It's a uh, it's a tributary of Lance Creek um, south of here. It's on uh, private land, uh, and it was on privately held land at the time of the incident. There's Billy Miller, uh, Western County Sheriff. As these two bands were traveling through uh, northeastern Wyoming, uh, complaints were made to Miller that they were uh, poaching antelope, and maybe even uh, uh, killing some cattle. So Miller set out with a group of men, uh, a posse composed of about a half a dozen men, uh, and encountered them uh, on October 30 of 1903. Um, the reports are that Charlie Smith the Carlisle Indian School graduate uh, rode up during the time that Billy Miller was encountering the uh, the, the Indian bands with uh, an antelope draped over his uh, over his uh, horse that had been beheaded. There's all kinds of questions, but the main question is: Do our citizens want this? So let's have a town hall. And there's more to it than that. There's and, a lot more to it. Um, it and, but we've seen it's sort of been a, a perfect storm. Um, after the newspaper, me primarily suggested a few years ago, the conversation needed to be had. Everybody thought I was saying the move needed to be made. And even if you make the move, you're talking about, I think, realistically, probably a two to four year transition. You know, a lot of the people who talk about, oh, people's jobs and everything. This isn't something you do overnight. It, even I think when you decide to do it, what you do is you start a clock. Hell, we've seen shifting from city landfills to regional landfills takes two decades for crying out loud. I don't think it should take that long. That's ridiculous. But over his uh, horse that had been beheaded, which Miller understandably took to be, and he may have been right, proof of poaching. <laughs> anyway. Miller met with these two bands and told them that they were under arrest. He wanted to arrest them and take them into Newcastle for illegal, illegally taking game. The problem was that uh, his warrant was not for Weston County. His warrant was outdated. It had been issued on October 20, so it actually could not have even applied to the Charlie Smith band who didn't leave Pine Ridge until October 20. And the warrant was issued in the names of John Doe and Richard Rowe. So Miller encountered these two bands, told them he wanted to arrest them and take them into Newcastle. William Brown, the leader of one of the bands, seemed to be in agreement with that. Uh, Charlie Smith basically said no. Uh, Miller read the warrant to Charlie Smith and the rest of them. And of course, he's got this warrant, which like I said, was outdated, different county, uh, issued in the names of, uh, told him to go and arrest John Doe and Richard Rowe. And Charlie Smith said, uh, I know the law better than you do, and I'm not going to Newcastle. I'm going back to Pine Ridge. And uh, you can't do anything about it. And uh, Sheriff Miller um, wisely decided that's probably not a good idea to have a confrontation at that time. Um, so he agreed to leave the area, go back to Newcastle, and, and get a few more guys for the posse. 
Uh, while they were there at the place where the two bands had camped, uh, William Brown's wife prepared uh, a meal for the uh, for the five posse members that were with Billy Miller. Uh, so they all sat down and broke bread together, uh, which I always thought was kind of an interesting incident. And just as an aside, if in fact these people had been poaching antelope, I wonder if the posse dined on antelope stew uh, <laughs> that, that day, but uh, it's not recorded what exactly they were served. But one of the uh, posse members later said, uh, it wasn't bad, it was probably the best she could do under the circumstances that she took good care of us in making that meal. Well, so the two bands are left alone while Miller goes back in to secure more guys for his posse. And he returned the next day and said, uh, okay, I'm back, uh, and I still have this warrant, and you're all under arrest, and you have to come with me. And Charlie Smith again said, no, we're not coming with you. Now, I forgot to mention, but I'll mention now, and it works. The day before, when the posse first confronted these bands of Indians, one of the Indian women had started a song which frankly scared the posse guys to death. They had no idea what she was singing, and we still don't. Uh, but it, it was a wailing song as described by the cowboys, and they found it very frightening. Uh, and also, an Indian male scooped some dirt off the ground and threw it in the air. That also scared the posse. So the next day, when the posse this time supplemented with a half a dozen more men, so there's nine or ten guys, along with Sheriff Miller, that return to the Lightning Creek scene. Uh, and there they, they uh, hid behind a kind of a berm or a bunker. Uh, the lawyer for the state of Wyoming, who later prosecuted or attempted to prosecute the Indians for murder, uh, said in a letter to Governor Chatterton, that the posse was armed, dangerous, and hid behind this berm uh, as if they were to ambush uh, the Indians. Whether that was their intent or not, I guess we'll never know, but that's what it looked like to the prosecuting attorney, of all people. Um, so there's this other confrontation where Charlie Smith says, uh, I'm not coming with you, you have no right to arrest me, I know the law better than you do, and goodbye. Within a few minutes, shots were fired. Uh, we don't know who fired the first shot. Uh, obviously the posse members who survived said the first shot was fired by a fellow named Black Kettle, uh, who later died in the firefight. Uh, the natives uh, said, no, the first shot came from the posse. They couldn't identify the shooter. But So there was a dispute as to who fired the first shot. Uh, one thing we do know, or several things we do know, is that uh, Billy Miller was killed shortly after the fight started. The fight only lasted about five minutes. And one or two minutes into the fight, uh, Billy Miller took a shot. Uh, uh, and was mortally wounded, as it turns out. Didn't die right away, stayed alive for, I think, about a half an hour, and was uh, dragged uh, by members of the posse into one of the buildings that existed there at the time uh, to try to recover. This is late October, so it's starting to get kind of chilly. Uh, they put him in there. Uh, and he died from his wounds, basically on the scene. His tombstone here at the uh, Newcastle Cemetery. Not even forty. Death is death is certain. The hour unseen. Of course, he left uh, his widow and five children, 
And I might mention that uh, some years later, the Wyoming legislature uh, appropriated $2,000 for Anna Miller, a uh, rather meager sum. And they didn't even give it to her all at once. She had to take it in uh, installments over a period of years, so really wasn't a lot of help to her. Uh, another member of the posse that was killed in the firefight was Louis Falkenberg. He was a uh, wolf hunter, um, lived in Douglas. Uh, he's often referred to in accounts of the battle as Deputy Falkenberg. Uh, he was a deputy in the sense that he had been conscripted to, by Sheriff Miller to be a, a part of the posse. So, I mean, it wasn't like he was a permanent full-time deputy. Um, he died in the firefight. He was shot um, uh, in the femoral artery and bled out rather quickly and died rather quickly. Um, a couple of days after the battle, they took him in, took his body into Newcastle, but they got a telegram from the bank in Douglas saying, uh, uh, we want him buried in Douglas. We will take the, uh, we will bear the expenses of transporting his body to Douglas and take care of it there. Uh, he was a popular guy too, like uh, Sheriff Miller. The funeral for Deputy Falkenberg boasted a long procession of mourners and drew one of the largest public gatherings in Douglas history. Funds raised from the citizens of Douglas were used for the monument that now marked, marks his remains, which is there. I don't have a very good picture of it uh, in the Douglas Cemetery. So they were the two deaths of the posse, Sheriff Billy Miller and Louis Falkenberg. On the Indian side, the first death was a young teenage boy named Peter White Elk. Peter was uh, uh, riding a horse, having closed a gate for the wagons to go through. This was private land and there were some fences around there. Uh, he'd opened and closed a gate and was riding on his horse. His horse was shot out from under him and then he was shot in the back of the head, which of course was fatal. Uh, was wearing a cap at the time and that cap later turned up in the hands of a member of the posse as a kind of a trophy. But Peter was either 12 or 14. It's not real clear, the accounts put him there. Um, and he was the first death on the Lakota side. There was a guy named Gray Bear who was shot. Uh, one of the, he was about 43 years old. Uh, he was mortally wounded, but did not die for about 24 hours. Uh, in fact, he didn't die till the next day. Some Lakota people came back to the scene the next day and found his, found Charlie uh, leaning up against a bank covered with frost, but still alive. Oh my goodness. And they took him into the same outbuilding where Billy Miller's remains had been taken earlier, and Charlie died there. Or rather, Gray Bear died there. I, I'm sorry, I get him mixed up with Charlie. Uh, Charlie, the notorious leader of the gang, that said, I'm not going with you, Sheriff Miller, to Newcastle. He was in his late 30s at the time. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he, was, he was shot and killed in the battle, as was uh, Black Kettle, who, uh, a fellow in his early 60s, uh, who the posse believed had fired the first shot that started the firefight. Uh, in fact, uh, he's the only member of either of the two Lakota bands that was identified as a shooter by you, any of the posse members. They, te they all testified that Black Kettle fired shots and they believe fired the first shot, but um, he's the only Lakota who was identified as having fired shots. 
I think it's kind of interesting to note that the uh, shots fired by the Lakota did kill two people in leadership positions in the posse, but the uh, 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 posse appears to have fired somewhat indiscriminately, starting with a teenage boy, and another death was uh, a woman who was, uh, well, Charlie Smith's wife. She was also wounded, but she didn't die for several days. Uh, she took a shot in her right shoulder and the bullet traveled through her breast. Uh, so there were four Lakota and two posse members that were killed in this firefight. Uh, there was a young woman, teenage girl named Hope Clear, who provided a lot of eyewitness testimony. Uh, she's the one that elaborated on the story of, of Peter White Elk's death. She herself had a horse shot out from under her and a bullet grazed her. Did not hurt her, but went through an article of clothing she was wearing. Um, so she provided some of the uh, testimony and some of the eyewitness accounts of this five minute gun battle. Well, uh, what was left of the posse and also law enforcement? Uh, traveled uh, east following the Lakota uh, band. I might also mention too that uh, the posse took Charlie Smith's wagon, he's now dead, and used it to transport uh, uh, Billy Miller's and Louis Falkenberg to Newcastle. Uh, spoils war, I guess. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, Law enforcement pursued the Lakota, who were traveling slowly with wagons and whatnot, and they got as far as Edgemont, where nine of Indian males were arrested, taken into custody, and uh, taken to Douglas for legal proceedings. These legal proceedings occurred in the uh, uh, first two weeks of November following the shootout. And this is a photograph of the guys that were taken, the Indian guys, that were taken to Douglas for legal proceedings. I, I always thought it's interesting, they got them to pose for this thing. You know, I, I can just see the photographer saying, no, no, uh, you, one of the tall guys, you get down in front and move a little to the left. You know, they got a, they got a nice picture and posed them all. Uh, for this uh, legal proceeding. So they had, they set up a preliminary hearing. Uh, the prosecuting attorney named Meekum, M-E-C-U-M, Meekum, and uh, the Department of Indian Affairs instructed the Wyoming United States attorney, a named Burke, to represent uh, the Indians. John Brennan, the Indian agent from Pine Ridge, who had issued the permits for the bands, uh, heard about the matter, obviously, and he got on a train in Shadron and went out to Douglas uh, to observe the proceedings. So they had a trial, well, a preliminary hearing, actually, uh, and the preliminary hearing is transcribed, and there is a transcript that ultimately became part of the United States Congressional Record. Uh, the testimony at the trial consisted obviously of posse members uh, and also some of the Lakota. Uh, and after the preliminary hearing, a judge dismissed the case. And the reason he dismissed it is because there was really no evidence other than the testimony that Black Kettle fired the first shot there was no evidence of which individual shot Billy Miller and or Louis Falkenberg. In other words, they couldn't identify the shooter. So uh, uh, just as a matter of uh, applying the law to the situation, the judge uh, dismissed the case saying, sorry, you can't tell me who the shooter was, so you're gone. Now most of 
the uh, most of the area, surprisingly enough, was pretty supportive of these of this result of dismissal. Uh, at the time, there were a number of Native Americans that were working for the railroad in Douglas, uh, and apparently the community had accepted them pretty well. So, for the most part, the, at least the community of Douglas, as opposed to the community of Newcastle, was uh, in favor of the result, the dismissal. Uh, none of the Indians who were at that time freed and taken back to Pine Ridge by train by John Brennan, none of the Indians were ever charged with uh, poaching. And I, I guess that's, not I guess, I think that's understandable in light of everything that had happened. Uh, you know, the deaths, the shootout, all of that, uh, poaching was pretty secondary at the time and they decided just to let the band go. The uproar in the state of Wyoming uh, started out pretty quickly. This is a handwritten letter from John Brennan. Uh, I don't know how well you can read it, but uh, of nine Indians under arrest, charged with murder, acquitted, we'll take them home by train this morning. Uh, the uproar through the state of Wyoming was different from that in the immediate area of Douglas. The governor of Wyoming chattered and uh, demanded that there be, sorry, I'll cut it, stay out of your way, but I do tend to walk around as you may have noticed. Uh, Chatterton demanded an investigation uh, and he got one. Uh, there was a congressional hearing, which consisted mostly of the transcript uh, of the uh, preliminary hearing that had been held in Douglas. And the congressional investigation really did not go very well uh, for Governor Chatterton. Uh, um, the investigation determined that really uh, well, I would say they put most of the blame for the incident uh, on the posse. Uh, the Indian agent McNichols uh, wrote, the sheriff's posse was no Sunday school class. Cowboys and bartenders predominated in the makeup of the white, of the white party. Several of them were entire strangers to the original party. Sheriff Miller did not know whether they, have, they had coolness, judgment, and steady character. But they did have guns and were willing to join the party. They had no wives other than Sheriff Miller. And babies with them, they were a compact party. party. They had no wagons or other property with which to lose. They had chosen their ground. Uh, uh, set up an ambush uh, by the uh, berm. And as the approved statement of the Newcastle Times said, all necessary arrangements had been made for the approaching conflict, arrangements by the posse. The Indians had not made any such preparations. Uh, one thing, as I mentioned right at the outset, the law was on Wyoming's side. The United States Supreme Court had said that Indian hunting rights had been taken away when Wyoming was admitted to the Union. Uh, by the way, this ruling stood until 1999 when the United States Supreme Court reversed it and said no, the, uh, native hunting rights do exist because of the treaty and regardless of the location. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, a Reagan appointee, uh, wrote the opinion that basically reversed that racehorse case that had been the law in Wyoming in the 1890s. Uh, but at the time, the prevailing attitude from people who were not familiar with the Supreme Court was that the Indians did have a right. Uh, in fact, the newspapers interviewed a prominent lawyer in Deadwood who said, yeah, they can hunt anywhere they want. Well, uh, he was wrong. Uh, 
And at least as far as the law is concerned, uh, Sheriff Miller was right. Uh, there were, as I suggested earlier, uh, three or four technical problems with Sheriff Miller's attempted arrest. Uh, the warrant was in the wrong county. It was outdated. It couldn't possibly have applied to Charlie Smith because it, and his band because at the time that the warrant was issued, uh, Charlie Smith hadn't left Pine Ridge. Uh, the warrant was in the names of uh, John Doe and Richard Rowe didn't apply to Charlie Smith. Uh, so Charlie may have been right, fatally so, in insisting that the warrant didn't apply to him and Sheriff Miller didn't have the jurisdiction or the power to arrest him and his band. The, as I said, um, Sheriff Miller and Louis Falkenberg were taken from the scene. Their bodies were taken from the scene to Newcastle. The Indians who did who died at the scene, uh, Charlie Smith, Gray Eagle, Peter White Elk, uh, uh, they were buried at the scene. In 1936, Dave Thompson, a member of the family that owned the land where the incident took place, reported, in 1936, two old hoppy jitneys, old cars full of Lakota Indians stopped at our ranch house and asked permission to go down to Lightning Creek and dig up the remains of the relatives and comrades that had been buried after the battle in 1903. There were two elder Indian survivors from the battle, and they did all the work at the burial site. One would find a tree or where a tree had been, then step to another tree, and if the steps didn't come out right, they'd try another route. After two or three tries, and the right space between trees was found, the second Indian paced off some steps, dug and located bones. Three to four bodies were located in the near darkness of the evening light. Uh, it was only a remarkable event. In addition to the weekly printed version of the newsletter journal, we also promote our community and share important information on our award-winning website, newslj.com, and in our weekly email newsletter, Nuke Now. We also connect with readers through various social media platforms and invite you to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can even take a look at a recent meeting of the City Council, School Board, or County Commission on our YouTube channel. We do hope that you will go to NewsLJ.com and subscribe today, and we look forward to making all of our great content available to you. But regardless of your level of support, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing your part to preserve a free and independent local press. It was only a remarkable event. Uh, by the way, I should have said it's this at the beginning. There's probably people here who know at least as much as I do about this incident, if not more. And I'm happy to take interruptions, questions, comments, criticism, anytime. Uh, during my presentation, you can interrupt me. Raise your hands, and and I'll call you on you. Call on you uh, if I feel like it. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll call on you. I will feel like it. Uh, the controversy about Brennan's permitting of Lakotas to travel to this area continued, uh, and uh, lots of people in Wyoming wanted Brennan fired from his position at Pine Ridge, but he held that job for another 12 years. Uh, so the feds liked him at least. And he got tired of people criticizing him. He wrote to uh, Chatterton saying, Indians from Wyoming visit this reservation, Pine Ridge, in large numbers every year. You yourself met a number of them at the time when you had a council. They were from the Shoshone Reservation. 
They visit, hunt, and kill game to their heart's content and are treated royally by our Indians and whites uh, in, the, uh, in the area of the county. They are not treated like animals or a pack of wolves the way they had been treated in Wyoming. By the way, uh, Sheriff Miller did have, he arrested some, uh, some two or three Indian elders with that original October 20 warrant. Uh, and they were in jail in Newcastle for a, about the two week period before and after the battle. Uh, John Brennan got them released from the Newcastle jail without further charges and for time served. Uh, and Brennan observed these Indian elders didn't even own guns, and I'm not sure they would have been able to use one, uh, but they had been held in the Newcastle jail for a couple of weeks on the poaching warrants. Uh, this has been called, probably correctly, the last battle of the uh, Plains Indian Wars. Uh, occurred in the 20th century. Um, unnecessary from either side. There's probably different ways to handle uh, an arrest on suspicion of poaching. Different ways for Charlie Smith to have responded. Different ways for Sheriff Miller uh, to have responded. Uh, but uh, hard to second guess him. It was his job to seek out and uh, arrest poachers. So that's pretty much my presentation. And I'd be happy to take questions, comments, criticisms, uh, additions, anything you want to say about this, uh, have at it. Or you can leave. <laughs> uh, do you know anything more about Governor Chatterton? I, I see he served less than two years. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know anything. Uh, I've never heard of him before. And <coughs> you know, good looking guy. April nineteen oh three to January nineteen oh five. You know, there's nothing named after him that I can think of. Here's John Brennan, the villain. If you give me a couple of minutes, I may be able to dig them up because I, I think I have a copy of the uh, transcript of proceedings. Glenn, who's Frank Zerbs? I think he was in on it, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he was. You're right. Frank Zerbs. Uh, no. Did he just have a blank Okay, here's some names. Oliver Johnson, Fred Howell, Jack Moore, Ralph Hackney, James Davis, Louis Falkenberg, Frank Zerbst, Charlie Harvey, Steve Franklin, Harry Kuhn, and George Fountain. I heard a couple of responses to uh, uh, the name Zerbst. Right here. You're a Zerbst? Yes. Frank was my granddad's brother, and he had a home set on Lodgepole. Honored to meet you, sir. Pardon? Honored to meet you. Oh, sir. thank you. <laughs> and the story in uh, Pioneers of Cheyenne River says that Frank was uh, still a, a target when the things was, when the battle was over, said he didn't know whether he was brave or he was too scared to take shelter. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been pretty scary for about five minutes here. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's fine. 
Yes. When Brennan gave those permits to leave the reservation, was, was that with the understanding that they were going to go hunting, or why was the, what was the purpose of uh, the understand The permits were specifically, they were in writing, and they were specifically to gather uh, herbs, berries, uh, grasses for uh, sustenance and ceremonial purposes. They were not to go hunting. So if they were hunting, by the way, uh, should have mentioned this earlier. One of the one of the Lakota people said we didn't kill any antelope illegally. Uh, we got hired by a sheep herder to uh, do some work around the place, and and uh, he gave us uh, and we we gave him beads and moccasins, and he gave us some antelope meat. Now that sounds a little far fetched, but. Uh, uh, in fact, there was a sheep herder named Isaac Otter who was interviewed uh, within a few months of the incident, and he corroborated it. He said, yes, I did hire some of these Lakota to work for me for a few days, and uh, I did pay them in part in meat. Um, pretty hard to escape the fact that Charlie Smith did have this freshly killed antelope draped over his horse at the time. Yes. I spoke with Dave Thompson about a month ago that owns the property where this happened, and he told me that uh, along about early 1960s, somebody had come out and put up three or four headstones, and he said they're still there. So, and he would show them to me if I come down, and I'm hoping to go down and see him. Well, sometime. Just before I started talking, this woman, this woman here, <laughs> gave me two photographs of a stone marker at the site. A cabin where Sheriff Billy Miller died October 31, 1908 by Indians. Uh, Was that 08 or 03? 03. 03. Um, 03. I'm sorry, I misread that. Yeah. yeah, he didn't live five years. Uh, and, and I had not seen these before. I was not aware of them. Uh, so I'll, I'll put them, I'm going to take them with me. She gave them to me. I'm going to send you the actual file so that you can email you the file so then you can print a slide or whatever to put in the machine. Could you hold those up for just a second? I could do that, you bet. And then I'll leave them on the table That's so good. people want to look at them. Hmm. They're nice pictures. <clears throat> I don't know if it was when you just said Dave Thompson. We ordered that. We I was about from here. I would be on my ranch, and that's where the headstone was. It wasn't very far off. And the bottom of the cabin that you mentioned, of one of the buildings, <coughs> was still a couple of. The place that I lived was the Lightning Creek Ranch, and it was right next to Dave Thompson. And I found that headstone. It's about this big, and it's somebody did good work, and, and it's carved in. I think it says he was killed here, <laughs> and um, so whoever did it. But anyway. Um, that's all I know. It's been there for a long time. and It wasn't a foundation and a part of that cabin. Right, there, huh? right. I meant to say that. There was about two logs, rotten logs, of the foundation of the cabin and that headstone. But there weren't any other headstones. And there'd be no reason for someone to even find that. <laughs> That's My email's on the card. Okay, I'll email you the... the you need to move that from the speaker. Was somebody on the ranch next to you? Yeah, Dave Thompson. Oh, okay, but that was just the site that nobody had ever touched it. Or no, I mean, nobody had ever known. They wouldn't have seen it. I was just letting a cow through a gate, and I just walked around. <laughs> and I said, wow, that is cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. Quite a find. I have a, an additional question. Uh, our historical society took a tour of uh, the Cheyenne River and we had lunch at the Fiddleback Ranch. 
this last uh, Saturday, and I was wondering in your research, uh, did the Fiddleback Ranch name appear in any of the the records? Boy, it rings a bell. I and I think the bell it rings is because maybe Billy Miller might have worked there for a while. I think that's why I'm registering that name, Fiddleback Ranch. Uh, when 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 he and Anna moved uh, to the Newcastle area, he worked at the ranch hand before they had their milk ranch and dairy farm. So I'm thinking maybe that's where I ran across that name. <laughs> Sorry. Anything? Anything else? Yes, sir. I was doing some research and found a, a interview with Helen Oliver, who was Billy Miller's daughter, and she was talking about being in school that um, Halloween in 1903 when his her mom Anna got word that her dad had gotten killed, and they had taken his body by wagon south to the railroad because it was pretty pretty close as a crow flies to the railroad. And Anna got on the train in Newcastle and went to like Crawford to meet the body and came back via train, which I had never had read in, until um, I found this audio tape of Helen talking and Cindy's got it at the museum. It's kind of interesting if you like that sort of thing on listening to Billy's daughter talking about, you know, the hanging of Slim Clifton and then Billy getting killed and all that. So it's pretty interesting and she was extremely sharp when she did this interview and did talk about a, like a babysitter watching the kids while Anna went to Nebraska to, to claim Miller's body. So I, I just found that a few weeks ago. So that, that makes sense, railroad connections being what they were. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would go there. I hadn't run across, I didn't know that. <coughs> uh, I just kind of jumped to the conclusion that he was taken to Newcastle by wagon. Would have been Quite a trip. Oh, yeah. A couple days, maybe, by wagon. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it's, you know as Rondi Dangerfield always used to say, What a crowd! What a crowd! <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.